Hey guys, welcome back to Survival Prepping for Normal People. I wanted to do a video today about the state of affairs here in America. Where we are. You know, it seems that everywhere you look, you can't help but find stories about socialism, candidates running promising socialistic ideas, socialistic solutions to our problems, you see poll after poll where younger people think socialism is a good idea. Because socialism, in a nutshell, preys on that old human emotion of envy, right? Being envious of what your neighbor has that you don't have. Socialism takes that old primal instinct and amplifies it and focuses on it and uses it as a political weapon. Well, your neighbor's rich because somehow he stole that from everybody else. Maybe he worked his ass off. Maybe that's why he has things you don't. Why does socialism appeal to young people? Young people have a distorted sense of fairness. They think that everything should be fair and equal and everybody should be treated the same. And when you've been herded through the indoctrin I'm sorry, the education system, like cattle for the last 13 or 17 years of your life, you have been treated the same. And that's not always a good thing. The problem with socialism is everybody has to be the same. It's not enough that you have equality of opportunity where everybody has the same chance to be successful, but because some people are more driven than others, some people are smarter than others, some people are more talented than others, and yes, some people are more corrupt than others, they find ways to get ahead. So equality of outcome is not going to be the same because people are all born different. Socialism is a lazy form of government because you don't have to deal with people on an individual case-by-case -case basis. You can have one-size-fits-all rules and if the people don't fit in, then they fit out. And you find a nice little place to send them, a pleasant little camp in the furthest reaches of your hinterlands where they can learn to be good citizens and maybe one day when they've broken enough rocks, cut down enough trees, dredged enough swamps by hand, they can return to society and become, I don't want to say productive members of your socialistic ideas, they can become conforming members. The title of this video, I want this to sink in for a lot of you guys. A lot of you get it. Some of you may be on the cusp of understanding it. Some of you are still in denial that something like this could happen in our country. Okay. Free stuff does not equal free people. It's actually the opposite. You can have free stuff or you can have free people in your society, but you can't have both. Because eventually, the takers, those who want free stuff, outnumber the makers. And when the makers refuse to give up what it is they produce so that everybody else can have free stuff that was promised to them by corrupt politicians who want to enforce a lazy form of government, those producers are forced to do so at the barrel of a gun. Doesn't sound very equal to me. Doesn't sound like any kind of paradise either. Sounds pretty messed up. So let's look back at the history of democracy. America is not a democracy. It was never been, meant to be a democracy. The Founding Fathers never used the word democracy in any of their writings. And there's a reason. They understood how vile, evil, corrupt, and twisted democracy really is. So let's go back through time, shall we, to ancient Greece, and let's look at what true democracy was. There were city-states that were ruled by kings. There were city-states that were ruled by elected rulers, representatives from among the people. Let's take a look at ancient democracy and how it worked. In the ancient democratic systems, the only people who were allowed to vote were men. They had to be adults and they had to own land. And there was a reason for this. The people who set up ancient democracies understood how dangerous the give me, give me, give me attitude could be. So if the only people who were allowed to vote were people who already had skin in the game, so if they decided to give themselves a bunch of free shit, that wasn't just magically going to come from somebody else. 
That was going to be a bite out of their own ass. So that's why they were the only ones who were allowed to vote. And this worked well for a time. And anytime something came up of significance or import, it was voted on by all the citizens, men who owned land, who lived in the area, who had some skin in the game, some say-so. And they realized that their decisions not only affected the regular people, but it affected them as well. Their fates were intertwined. It was a symbiotic relationship, if you will. So if they voted for things that were bad for the people, the people would get upset, the people wouldn't go out and produce, and these wealthy landowners wouldn't be as wealthy or own land anymore. So, in general terms, they took care of the people by the standards of their time, which <laughs> we wouldn't put up with today, but it was what it was. Eventually, though, at one of these forum meetings, somebody stood up and said, I would like to ask the treasurer for an accounting of how much coinage is in the city's treasury. And the treasurer gave his report. And this individual would say something along the lines of, I move that every one of us here who are representing today and voting on these issues, I move that we all divide up equally among ourselves the money in the treasury. It would get a second and everybody would vote. And if the majority decided to take all the money out of the treasury and give it to each other and slap each other on the back because they all just became a little wealthier, then the city state no longer had money for defense, for infrastructure, for taking care of the sick and the poor or whatever else it was that they did. That was over because now the government was broke and it no longer existed. It could not function as a state. That's why democracy is dangerous. Let's fast forward to modern democracy, where politicians promise the masses free things, and those free things come from people who produce and pay taxes. And it was only a matter of time until the people wanting free stuff outnumbered the people providing free stuff. All the while, the middleman the one standing between the citizenry and the treasury, garnered power, bribed people for their votes by promising them free things. The people that the so-called democratic left represent, the poor, the downtrodden, the dispossessed, the outcasts, the fringe elements of society, how many of them have had their lot improved in the last 40 years by all the programs and promises these politicians have made and invented and handed over to make these people's lives better. Ghettos are larger than ever. We have more poverty in this country than we've ever had. After trillions and trillions of dollars have been spent to uplift the poor. They don't want to uplift the poor. They lose political power if they have nobody left to make promises to. If they have nobody to offer bread and circuses to, they lose power. Now, it's estimated that right now, only 47% of the people who live in the United States actually pay taxes into the system. That means 53% take more out than they pay in. And this is a hard sell because you can't convince somebody who works at McDonald's and sees withholding tax coming out of their check every two weeks that they don't pay taxes. They think they do. So if they pay in $3,500 over a year's time and they go to file their taxes and they qualify for head of household exemption, income tax credit, child care credit, and all that, they've paid in $3,500, but they get a check from Uncle Sam for $7,800 for making up the disparities. They come out $4,300 ahead, which means everybody else has to bear the burden of being $4,300 in the hole for that person. We are quickly, quickly approaching the point where there will be so few makers and so many takers that the system will collapse under its own weight. And those in power are panicking because they know this system is not sustainable. They know that it can't keep going. Do I say that we just leave the poor in the gutter and do nothing? No. What we need to do is figure out a way to give people a hand up and not a hand out. 
free stuff or free people. You can't have both. These meager bread and circuses that uh, the power-hungry politicians promise and hand out and keep the unwashed masses placated and subdued. And now you've got uh, Ying Yang out there running around talking about universal basic income. Sounds good to people who don't have anything. Sounds good to people who may not have a future. And I think that's why the young are glomming on to this shit like crazy. They don't see a future. Not like their parents and their parents had. And they're not going to have one like that. Mathematically, it's unsustainable. There are two choices facing our system right now. One... We go off the cliff and let all, let all this shit explode in a fiery crash when everything comes tumbling down because it can't sustain itself. Or, they admit that it's all bullshit anyway. That it's all manipulated currency bullshit, placated economic falsities. And everybody figures out that the emperor has no clothes. The system comes crashing down for lack of faith in a bullshit fake system. They are painted into a corner. This happens a lot in history. Their answer has always been totalitarianism. You can call it democratic socialism. You can call it whatever you want to. It's people being forced to behave the way the government wants them to. And then you have two choices. Fall in line. Or never be seen again. Pretty stark. But that's where we are. That's one of the reasons I prepare. And you should too. I want to thank all of you for being here on the team. And I want to ask you, what have you done today to get ready for an uncertain future?